Hey, hey! Feels good to be back. Been on a hiatus. Uh, I'm not going to quote um, LL Cool J. Don't call it a comeback. It's corny as all hell. Hey, my name's Ryan Tamori. Uh, I am one of the owners and host of this lovely live show today. Uh, we are the Pit Press. Um, hope everybody's doing well. We've got a lot of house cleaning to do. We've got a lot to talk about. Um, I think the last time we did anything was the day before the tournament. And we thank uh, Nick Lorenzen from um, Mid Major Madness, who picked UNM to go to the Final Four, um, but also picked Duquesne to beat BYU. So kudos to him. A um, lot to get to today. <sighs> Before I introduce the entire uh, the gang, as I always say, UNM men's basketball, Jalen House at the All Star Game, <laughs> preseason polls for next year, um, some coach the coaching carousel, the domino effect there, Lobo football, whatever's going on there, um, and then other news around Mountain West Conference basketball uh, and football. I think Transfer Portal will try to get to that. Obviously, the NCAA tournament, UConn looked like uh, t- terrible joke. Uh, he looked like they looked like every bit um, of one of the most dominant sports runs in the, it is probably one of the most dominant, if not the most dominant uh, in sports in the sports in the history of this country. Uh, if you don't like Danny Hurley, I think you have a problem with yourself. Obviously I understand if you're Providence alum, maybe St. John's alum, maybe Seton Hall alum, Syracuse alum, Georgetown alum. Um, I think they're a lot of fun to, to watch, um, and uh, I don't know. I love Danny Hurley, and uh, Ed, I'll get to you. You were at the Final Four, so we'll talk to you about that. Um, kind of give a shout-out to our sponsors early on, but I wanted to also uh, thank Turquoise Desert Tap Room. If you're looking for a place to watch the Lobos when they are on the road, or at least right now, hey, MLB, NHL playoffs, NBA playoffs are coming up. Head over to Turquoise Desert Tap Room. It's only a few minutes away from the Santa Ana, Santa Ana Star Casino. Go make a bet over there. Head over to the Turquoise Desert Tap Room. Watch all that action. Um, top high for food, drinks, and sports. Turquoise Desert Tap Room also serves local brews on tap. Find them on Facebook and Instagram at Turquoise Desert Tap Room. Also affordable solar and Abrazo Homes. Uh, I want to get the introduction to, um, as I always say, the gang, Mr. Eric Malton, my business partner in this endeavor and co-owner, co-host, whatever you want to call him. How are you, man? I'm good. Happy to jump back on you, with you guys. Um, obviously, we took a little bit of a hiatus after March Madness. Had some time to kind of regroup and just provide some different, some more direction of where our podcast was headed. Uh, special announcement: We've actually just partnered up with a, kind of a national uh, podcast partner or other podcast partners that cover college sports throughout the the country. Um, They're actually called uh, the Huddle, um, College Huddle Group. Um, So we're excited that we joined up with them. There's probably going to be more content that we we do with them kind of coming up covering preseason or or summer football. So um, excited to make that announcement, but happy to be back with you guys. And he is the voice of the Western New Mexico Mustangs, Lobo fan since 1970 and fresh off a trip to Valley of the Sun. He was at the Final Four, both games on Saturday, and then the championship game. Mr. Ed Nunez, how are you doing? How was your trip? You know, it was a, it was an incredible atmosphere. I went with my older brother, and you know, we don't always get to hang out very much. We've got family, uh, you know, uh, family um, things we have to do, and then he's still working. I'm at Western New Mexico quite a bit, and uh, I flew in there on Thursday. And uh, we went to the game, went to practices on on, on uh, Friday, saw the All-Star game in the first half, and went to the games on Saturday. And, you know, we'll get into it, and I'll get into it later, but just an incredible atmosphere, um, something I'll never forget. You know, my, my brother and I really enjoyed it. So, uh, yeah, lots to talk about with that, but uh, a very uh, enjoyable experience. That's awesome. And I will turn it to your son, Mr. Nick Nunez, who I'm very happy to have joined us. He is uh, a producer and a play-by-play analyst for, or excuse me, play-by-play commentator for ProView. Hey, man, how you doing? Ryan, good to be on, man. A little bit of a downtime for Lobo Sports, but still a lot of topics to talk, to talk about, so excited to get into it. All the way from the Bay Area. He's ready for the Masters. 
<laughs> he is he's a two time offensive state lineman for San Juan Mendoza, played for Damian Segura and an MVP of a thirty five and older Filipino league in Northern California. Richard. Mr. Richard Thompson, how you doing, man? I'm doing well, man. Missing uh, college basketball, trying to get into NBA here. Definitely looking forward uh, to the Masters and watching some golf here, but uh, ready to talk about some sports in the land of enchantment and Mountain West. Uh, always glad you can join us. Some house cleaning. Uh, we ran a contest, uh, a bracket challenge through the mothership. Um, $100 gift card. We're going to locate you. I uh, was going to make an announcement, and I thought I'd hold off after the game on Monday night um, in our bracket pool. We had over two. I came in dead last because I submitted a really shitty bracket. Um, I went with a lot of upsets. I had Drake in the Sweet 16. I had Jay Madison in the Sweet 16, and it was a very top-heavy tournament, uh, yeah. maybe other than NC State. Um, and I want to give a shout-out to – he's not with us tonight – Mr. Jacob Neff, he had uh, surgery on Monday. He's recovering from that. Um, I'm sure he's missing uh, talking about this. Uh, he had it the day of the national title game, and he, I, I can show it to you in a text. He had proof. Uh, you know, he said once UConn, it was UConn and Purdue. He said UConn was going to destroy uh, Purdue, and that second half was uh, pretty impressive by Dan Hurley, UConn, Donovan Klingman, Tristan Newton, my main man, Cam Spencer, transfer from Rutgers. Um, but anyway, to our bracket challenge, uh, congratulations. I don't know if it's an alias or a name. Kale Ramsey, sole first place. Uh, 14, 1,480 points, 1,400 points. You had UConn beaten uh, Purdue in the championship, and you had Alabama in the final four. Um, pretty impressive. Um, I was looking at one of your regions, uh, the Midwest. You had nearly perfect, so uh, we'll reach out to you uh, again. You, you guys were all, all lucky. I I was creeping I up was there at the end, and I almost <laughs> won our own challenge. So, just for any of you wondering if any of us know I, basketball, I did get lucky. I was just about to mention that, Rick. You uh, you came in fourth, um, and then we had Lobo safety his second pick, I left it open for two brackets. Um, yeah, I picked North Carolina to win. So well, I guess, you know, I don't know. Expletive, expletive me to coach the great coach Jason Brown from last chance. You on Netflix. Uh, yeah, Rick, I was just about to say that, man, you, you came in fourth. um, job. Well done. I was looking for Neff cause he, he and I came first and second in our office pool last year and we just split. We just split the winnings. So congratulations to Kalen Ramsey, a hundred dollar Visa gift card. We'll, we'll find you. We'll hunt you down. We'll post it on the interwebs on social media. Um, and, um, I think some merch, we've got some stuff that Eric's were. There you go, Eric. Here you go. Oh. Hoodie hoodie. We just got these printed. So we'll go ahead and get something. We'll reach out, get you that gift card, get you a free hoodie. Thanks for participating. What do we have? Like over 200 people jump in on that, didn't we? Yeah, we appreciate that. And we've had a lot of people watch us on our live stream, which is why we're starting to do it. I think tonight did it a little late. Um, and I think people are probably, I don't know. Are, I, I can't imagine you being burnt out from college basketball. Uh, we do have a comment. You're ha welcome to comment. We're usually filled up um, with people telling Rick and Ed they enjoy what they have to say and telling me to go to hell. Um, Jared Rael, I'm ready. Appreciate that, man. Um, <clears throat> we're going to get into Jalen House in the All-Star game. Um, I, I wanted to start off with the tournament as a whole. And UConn, uh, I mentioned it earlier, I thought UConn was dominant. I don't even have to say that. Um, I thought they were a lot of fun to watch all year. I don't know if we're ever going to see a run like that ever again. Um, and I've been telling people the last time UConn lost in the tournament, if you've forgotten, was in the first round in 2022 to a school by the name of New Mexico State University and Teddy Allen. So New Mexico State fan, I know we probably have a lot, predominantly a lot of UNM fans that listen. Um, I know there's a lot of, we've tried to expand our coverage to NMSU. There's a lot of NMSU alumni in northern New Mexico. Uh, you know, just a shout out there. Um, and they almost beat Arkansas and 
Eric Musselman two years ago. Um, I was impressed by UConn. It, 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 nothing ever needs to be like this in sports, but I felt like we needed UConn Purdue. Um, and that first half I thought lived up to the billing, but as far as Dan Hurley and Donovan Cleveland, it's Cleve Klingon, Cam Spencer, Tristan Newton. I mentioned all of it. Um, I, 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 you've, you've won and covered 12 games in a row in a championship setting. I, I don't knew the Patriots didn't do that. Steelers didn't do that. Lakers. I, you know, I can't, the Yankees. Um, I think it's as do, dominant of a run. I'm going to start with Ed because Ed was there. Uh, the atmosphere for the practices, the final four itself. I've always wanted to go to a final four. I don't know if in a football stadium, it changes the setting or the mood. Um, but you kind of had three basketball schools there. And then you had Alabama, who I think rightfully deserved. They were a very exciting, fun team to watch. Uh, Mark Sears, Nate Oates done a great job there. Um, Nelson, Brent Nelson, was Brad Nelson, Brent Nelson. Um, he had that, he posterized Donovan Klingon. Um, you know, for for everything that UConn did, they got posterized uh, over the weekend. Um, but uh, just your overall thoughts of being there, Ed, and take away from the basketball you watched. Um, and I, I don't know if you want to throw in your two cents about how I would compare to UNM. <laughs> well, you know, the the uh, the final four, it, I was uh, rooting for North Carolina State because the last final four that they had here, I got to see the championship game in 1983 when North Carolina State beat Houston. So I was kind of rooting for North Carolina State. But I think the ambience, everybody wearing the uh, – my brother and I had Lobo shirts on, and some of the uh, Wolfpack fans thought we were – you know, they have red, and their their logo isn't that much different. So they thought we were Wolfpack fans, and they'd give us the sign, and and they walked by. So that was kind of funny. But I, I really got a kick out of the Purdue fans because uh, they come dressed with the uh, gold and uh, brown jackets, the gold and brown pants, uh, the shirts – They've got their own little chance. So I really got a big kick out of their fans. Um, they, they, at the championship game on Monday, I thought they had three to one fans over UConn. You know, my brother and I looked around the stadium and they sure made a lot of noise. And that was quieted about, you know, after halftime. But, uh, you know, you watching the practices, then watching the All Star game. Uh, my brother, my brother played at St. Pius. My brother was a heck of a player. So my brother and I, you know, we can sit there and watch basketball and talk basketball all day long. And we had a great time. And we watched the first half of the all-star game on, uh, on Friday. So I, I couldn't, I couldn't get enough of the ambiance outside the stadium. They had a, uh, you know, uh, a, a shooting, uh, champ, uh, challenges, um, a band, um, man, it was, you know, they had that on Saturday. Then they had that on Monday. They got favorable weather. It was the warmest day on Monday. Saturday wasn't as warm, but Monday was very warm. So you had a lot of people out there enjoying the outside and, uh, you know, fans coming together. So the the atmosphere itself was unbelievable. Um, I don't I don't think uh, my brother and I will never forget that. There's no way. And then uh, I think uh, the games themselves. Uh, Alabama on Saturday, um, you know, they looked good for a long time, but uh, they you know they they weren't going to beat uh, they weren't going to beat UConn. You know, they they looked good, and uh, they they made some runs, and and I thought they played well. But uh, UConn, as you mentioned, um, Ryan with Dan Hurley. Uh, he said this on the radio, my brother put on mad dog sports. We were listening to that almost all weekend in the, in the, in his truck. We won and we won by a lot. He's cocky. You know, he gets after the refs. They're good. They're good. And he knows it the way he recruited and the players he brought in, he's up, you know, they're, they're on top of, uh, of the basketball world right now. And there's a reason why they shut off the three pointer on Sun on uh, Monday. They did a good job of closing out on uh, Edie's a very good passer. He'll you know, the good thing about uh, the thing about his passing is he'll get it, and as soon as the defense digs in on him, he'll pass it back out. And uh, usually it's too uh, they, they've got a long way to, to recover back. So I thought Connecticut adjusted to that, and they did a good job of closing out on the shooters. And uh, you know Purdue had had, uh, had a decent three point shooting throughout the tournament, but not on Monday. Connecticut was the best team, and we really enjoyed the. Like I said, uh, you know we're, we're we're it's a football stadium. Our seats are, are pretty far up. Uh, but that's okay. We enjoyed it. The atmosphere was great. So, uh, yeah, that, that was my takeaway from the tournament, just the, uh, the atmosphere, the ambience, and, and watching a great team like Connecticut. Um, you know, you mentioned, they mentioned Krzyzewski. They mentioned the run that Coach Wooden had at UCLA. And, uh, you know, Coach Hurley's had, uh, you know, his brother Bob is under a little bit of fire there. I was reading the Arizona Republic. They just signed him to a two-year extension. He's under a little bit of fire there. But his uh, the facilities there at Arizona State, are in dire need of renovation. They're 50 years old, and he needs they need they need uh, they need some renovations there. 
So it's kind of interesting to read about both Hurleys in the Arizona Republic. So uh, that's what I got out of it. I don't think that you know, my brother and I will never forget that trip, you know. Uh, so um, it's unbelievable to be there, just hear the fans and their reactions to their teams and see the way they're dressed and the way they support their teams. I, I, I just got a big kick out of that. I couldn't couldn't, <laughs> couldn't get enough of that. So uh, it was an enjoyable experience. I have a – can I – Go ahead. I want to get a question over through to Ed just because, I mean, he's the big man. He's the one that played the position, but – just the overall matchup, your takeaway from from Zach Eady and Donovan Klingen, probably two of the best bigs in the whole country. And you kind of just mentioned how how uh, Eady was a really good passer for most of the season, kind of drawing a lot of double teams and finding those shooters where in the championship game, Purdue didn't really have a whole lot of open looks from the outside. And I felt a lot of that was because they didn't need to draw a lot of double teams because Klingen, Klingen was really good about kind of handling – ed one-on-one even though that ed did get his points i think he finished with 30 plus but they pretty much took away every other option that that purdue had from the outside so just wanted to get your take on the overall matchup and that's two elite bigs that are going to be in the league one day i think ed's got an edge you know on clinging i think he's definitely got an edge because ed can turn left or right and you know he can put it up with the left hand hook as well um the first possession of the game uh, i saw it and i told my brother this clinging got him off the the sweet spot made him miss a a jump hook that was a uh, short, but then if he gets deep position in a deep post catch, forget it. That that's that's going to go in. You know, there's nothing you can do with him. So I thought, uh, you know, Purdue did a good job of giving getting the ball, running some good sets, getting him one on one, and uh, you know him turning to the basket and scoring. So I thought for a while there it worked, but per, uh, uh, you know Connecticut's defense in the second half took away the closeouts were really good. The closeouts were good. They got in contested three pointers, one shot and out. Somebody tried to say that uh, I think Edie got tired. You know, when you, you when you're a big man, Rick, you know you know how that goes, man. When you're a big man fighting for position down there, and people are, hey, you get tired. But I thought that guy played his heart out. I really did. Um, just I don't know about the pros. You know, my son and I have talked about that. My brother and I talked about that. In the pros, it's a little bit different. He's got to go out and guard people in space. He's it's a little bit different. He'll be on a roster for sure. How effective he'll be, I'm not. I'm not sure because you know, does can he get up and down in a uh, up tempo game in the pros? But he'll be on someone's roster. But I thought you know he was the key to them being there. If he's not there, they don't get as far as they got. They hadn't been to a championship game, I, I believe, in since 1969. So uh, they did a great job. But you know what? I said this before the game. I told my brother Purdue's going to win. A uh, UConn's going to win by 10 or 12. They won by 15. And uh, Ryan, I think you said Jacob had them big. You know, he thought they were going to win big. They, 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 they went to own by uh, 15. So, um, yeah, they're the best team in college basketball all season long. I don't think there's any question about it. They, they proved it again. So that one-on-one matchup, Eric, um, I think Edie's definitely got the, uh, the, the, uh, the advantage there. But Klingon was able to bother him with that size and, uh, you know, make him struggle a little bit in some, in some shots that he took. One-on-one coverage, though, 7-4. He knows how to score. He can turn left or right with a left-hand hook or a right-hand hook. And he's, and, uh, you know, he'll get it over you. How are you going to stop that? So I thought uh, they, he'd played a very good tournament, but UConn was a better overall team. Yeah, well, I will that's never do crazy. this. Go ahead, Go ahead Eric. Sorry. Oh, I was, was going to say, say, I will. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> no, Cleon's only a sophomore, too, right? Isn't he? Yes. He's still a he was a, fr- right? he was a freshman a by, he was a freshman by Adam Sanagan last year. Yeah. So he I- came off the bench. And then this one's for Ryan too. Cam Spencer, former Rutger. Oh yeah, that, that guy is man. His basketball IQ is through the roof. He's just so good about just playing smart basketball, getting guys up in the air. He's not the most athletic guy, but he was just the probably one of the better players on the court in that championship game. Yeah, but P- Purdue really played into what Connecticut wanted them to do, and they wanted Edie to get all the touches, right? And they wouldn't care if he scored 50 points. That's what they wanted, and they shut off the other uh, weapons that they had to a T. And I don't know, Ed, if he really has another move than turning to his left shoulder because he continued to do that, and it wasn't really till the second half that he turned to the other side. So if he doesn't have a counter to some of these moves, even though he's seven foot four, guys are going to sit on that shoulder. And much like we saw JT Toppin against Clemson, when they know that hook is coming and there's a guy that's equally your size, they can block that easily. So I don't know. 
you know, when looking at the draft prospects, I think Klingon is actually expected to go higher than Edie in the upcoming draft, surprisingly, um, mm -hmm. even though that, that's showing. But very exciting. I don't think we've seen a big man matchup since 19, a big man matchup like that since 1984. Akeem, before the H, Elijah Wan versus Patrick Chewing and Georgetown. Um, with Houston winning with Clyde the Glide as well. So I don't know if we'll ever see a big man matchup like that in the near future. So it was enjoyable. It was it was nothing against Alabama and it was nothing against NC State because uh, DJ Burns was RJ Burns, but it was <laughs> I'm messing up all the names tonight. I was thinking about D, you know just calling him DJ Burns, but um uh, um yeah, DJ Burns. What the hell am I thinking? I got to get my names right. Uh, I don't want to be on that Twitter funhouse where they mock Colin Cowherd and Mike Francesa and Mad Dog all the time. Uh, DJ Burns. Um, I don't know who didn't love him. <laughs> uh, I didn't want that run to end. I was pretty pumped, um, you know, that they got there. And that I, I don't know if there's some lore lost within March Madness, um, but they ripped off what nine eight nine games eight games to get there and i we went live right before during that virginia nc state game right before when uh that that player hit the three and the toilet bowl um i don't know it was phenomenal um and again mark sears mark sears mom um who's probably a little crazy but she's entertaining within herself um, you know, I don't normally want to say something like, like this because it feels like hot take, um, but it, it kind of needed to be UConn Purdue. I, I think it was set up for that. Um, and again, I don't know if it really lived up to the hype. That first half was good. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, NC State's got ties to the pit and, and uh, you know, Jim Valvano, who played at Rutgers, Eric and Ed. Um, yeah, Cam. I was I was all about Cam Spencer. Cam Spencer hit a big three at the beginning. It was the same night Monday night that Demar Hamlin had his you know that that tragic issue. I was watching that, uh, and they beat. He hit a three uh, in West Lafayette, and Rutgers knocked off Purdue and didn't make. Got in Nevada, got in over them in last year's tournament. Um, D. I don't know. DJ Burns will be sorely miss, sorely missed. Um, I will never do this again. Uh, I took four teams in December, January to win the tournament. Um, and I took North Carolina. I like their odds. I took Duke. I think a little bit later, I like their odds cause it was 25 to one. So a hundred dollar bet won you $2,500 and I took UConn and Purdue. So regardless of what happened on Monday night, uh, I was going to be, be up for the night. So I was really happy about that. And I just, I just didn't think, you know, I, I rolled with, with UConn. I, I didn't think, uh, they even covered the first half. They didn't cover the first half against Alabama, but they covered the first half against, um, uh, Purdue, uh, it was, I believe it was four and they, they covered by six. So anyway, um, I will never probably do that ever again. Uh, Nick, I just wanted your thoughts kind of change a little bit, maybe on the tournament as a whole, uh, and you know what you were able to, to, to watch. Yeah, no, I mean, I think for the most part, we got the two best teams. We've already alluded to how dominant a run it was for UConn. Um, obviously, NC State being the surprise team in the Final Four and what they had to do to even get into the tournament. I mean, they had to win five games in the ACC tournament just to get in. Um, it really speaks to the job that Kevin Keats, the job, uh, the head coach there that he did, Um no, I thought overall the tournament was pretty good. Sad that, you know, the Mountain West didn't turn out as well as we all had hoped. Um, some of the seeding that we had discussed on previous podcasts seemed to be a little unfair. Um, and I mean, you know, the matchup that UNM had, right? I mean, we all, UNM was a 1.5 favorite going into that game. Um, we've kind of broken down the Clemson game already. But um, no, I think overall it was a pretty good NCAA tournament. It was pretty exciting, um, and I think at the end of the day, the best team won. So it was a good NCAA tournament. I'll teach you some lingo. It was a point and a half. Um, but don't worry. You have a law degree. I Anyway. Uh, <laughs> 1.5, point and a half. Point and a half. Um, the game of the tournament was Texas A&M and Houston, I think, um, in the second round. That was phenomenal. Um, and... I don't know. It was a little bit of the usual suspects, not really with Tennessee, I don't think, but they've been to Elite Eights before. 
Um, that was a good game. Dalton Connect is is an amazing player. Um, I think he's I think he's entering the draft. Um, I don't know why you wouldn't, but um, anyway, uh, Rick, you have something to say? Just I guess one final thought on the on the Mountain <laughs> West and just the sure. overall tournament. I don't I don't know if we should be expecting six teams <laughs> moving forward. Um, I think this year was maybe an anomaly, right? Six out of the 11 teams getting in. I think probably around four is what we should expect uh, probably going forward. But just looking at this year, I think Boise, Colorado State, Utah State, and Nevada can all say they were underseeded um, in the tournament. But like we said a few weeks ago, until these teams start winning, they're going to continue to get those seeds. But um, I just wouldn't expect six teams in the tournament going forward, but this was one great year for us to be covering it. And um, some of the most competitive uh, basketball we saw around the country, and we're lucky to watch it. Yeah, uh, yeah i i don't I can't remember the last time we did a show. Um, it, it Colorado State did some justice, especially on the first night. <laughs> Uh, anybody would have beaten UVA. Thank God UConn or any of these top teams didn't have to play UVA. Um, I know they were in the ACC. Uh, boy, I thought Boise State showed up against a very talented Colorado team. You know, KJ Simpson, Tristan De Silva. Tristan De Silva is going to be in the first round. Um, that was a very talented Colorado team who gave Marquette all they could hand or handle. Tyler Kolek announcing today he's entering the draft. Um, he had an oblique thing, which I, I had understood is very unusual for a um basketball player uh but uh <laughs> you, you know UNM by losing by 22 and they were favored i think what did it in probably was nevada blowing that lead um 17 points with 5 to go i, I mean that's that's pure uh dump in your pants um Colorado State, what, lost to Texas. It wasn't pretty. They looked like UVA in the first half. Um, we touched on it, I think, after the UNM debacle. Um, but San Diego State, I'm usually a guy, and I'm repeating myself, I'm usually a guy who you play the hand you're dealt. Um, and I'm a big San Diego State supporter. I say that all the time. I'm a big proponent of the conference. Um yeah, you're going to advance when you're playing the Furmans and the Charlestons and the Yales of the world. Um, these smaller schools, it's cliche, and I'm just stealing thunder. You you get you you blow your first round, and you're able to do it like Yale did. Um, and then you can't do anything in the second round. I think it's it's it, it happens more than not that they get knocked out in the second round. Um, San Diego State was a victim of that, though. They they lost to Florida Gulf Coast in 2013 which got Florida Gulf Coast dunk city to the, uh, to the sweet 16. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I think the biggest travesty was probably Nevada because that happened in real time. There's one thing between being picked. Um, who's the, who's the girl. I completely forget her name and it's no disrespect on ESPN college game day. And she also does the men and the women. She had UNM in the final four. John Fanna had the UNM, UNM in the final four. I don't know. I think Nevada, shitting the bed there at the end of that game against a very good Dayton team. Um, that was the, the icing on the cake. That was not good. Um, and, um, Mark Ziegler of the union tribune, I support journalism. It's my background. Uh, I know he didn't go to San Diego state. Uh, I don't know what the hell he was pulled out of his butt and talked about that. Yukon was scared. um, I, 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 it's not my job. We're not here to call out other media members, but I don't know what the hell that was all about. Um, and our friend of the show, Tom Moser, you know, they kind of got in the tiff on, on Twitter, but I, I side with Tom on that now because we know him. Um, but, um, in other UNM news, unless Ed or Eric, you have anything one, else to one say about final the thing Go ahead, Rick. I think just looking forward to UNM and the schedule moving forward, I think we have to compare what New Mexico was this year versus Boise because to me, they're two very comparable teams. But Boise had a much stronger non conference schedule, right? They played Clemson. Um, they played Creighton, correct, and some other stronger schools, and they were still able to make 
the NCAA tournament at the end of the year, even though they didn't win the regular season or conference tournament. Whereas New Mexico, they had probably one of the weakest non-con conference schedules. No one wants to come to the pit. We can't even get St. Mary's to come to the pit. New Mexico's had to go there two times in a row. Because of that, we thought New Mexico was going to get in after maybe that semifinal conference tournament game. No, they weren't, right? Unless they won the, the conference tournament, they wouldn't have be, be in. So looking forward, I think they need to look at the Boise State model and say, well, we need a backup plan. If we're not going to win the regular season or conference tournament, we need to have a stronger non-con schedule so that we have a case at the end of the year because this year they wouldn't have had a case, right? Um, so just looking at those two um, and what New Mexico, I think, needs to look at moving forward if they want to become a consistent player in the postseason. I'll add to that, Ryan. I mean, I think we're kind of starting already with the Palm Springs Invitational. Uh, we'll be playing that in November of 2024. Uh, some other big names in there, USC, Arizona State, TCU, Washington State, St. Mary's. But to Rick's point, I think we got to get rid of that NMSU home and home series. I mean, Coach Patino has been talking about that. We don't need to play that game twice. Uh, one game, one game per year, I think is enough. But I agree with Rick. In order for us to be more competitive, we got to start scheduling some better teams. You know, I just want to uh, weigh in. Uh, you know, when my son says that about the uh, New Mexico State series, I'm an old guy, right? And it's uh, one of those things that how long has it been played for? But maybe, maybe uh, in Rick, uh, uh, to your point, I think that's a good point. It, the the team coming back next year, everyone's mentioned is going is ranked number twenty, uh, ranked already. You know, high expectations. So I think you don't want to chance anything. One 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 uh, one NCAA uh, official called New Mexico a bid stealer because they won the Mountain West tournament. They weren't expected to be in the tournament. We thought they were. I thought after they won the semifinal game, they were. We were all thinking they were in. So I, I think next year you don't want to leave anything to chance. You've got you know dance. In Washington, Amzil, uh, uh, Nelly, and and Toppin all coming back as of right now, and uh, you know, um, so with some other pieces coming in, the freshman uh, Dotson and Milovich, or however you say his name, those some good pieces coming in. So I, I think uh, with that, why would why wouldn't you shore up your your uh, your your schedule? I think you need to. It's it and, and you mentioned that Rick, it's hard to get people to come here to play at the pit. Very hard to get people to come to play here, but. And uh, son, you mentioned that too. That tournament you mentioned is going to be a, a very good, uh, you know, very good competition for New Mexico to strengthen that uh, that that power, uh, that schedule uh, that uh, people look at later in the year, and would have kept them out of the tournament had they not won the Mountain West tournament. So I think a lot of things have to be thought of for next year. Expectations we're already hearing where they're, they're what people think they're going to be next year. So. <laughs> expectations are already here and it's only what two weeks after the season yeah i think they could probably take a piece away from what what boise state did and traveled and, and played at clemson last year if no, you no, would no, no. Could no, have... no 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 they paid they played virginia tech clemson at disney world oh they did the okay, ESP well... events. no 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 they didn't go there they played them um in a tournament Okay. Well, regardless, I think they need to play someone of that caliber. And I, I'm referring to someone like in the big 12, right? Like, or, or like in Arizona, try to renegotiate something there, like a Texas tech, Texas Baylor, someone not, not that far, right. Traveling wise, but at least play someone of that caliber to get that experience. Those are big physical teams. And that's would be by far one of the best teams that you and them would have in their non-con. And if you have to go on the road for something like that, then you have to do that at least one game. But I know that you and them relies a lot on, on getting teams here. They got to fill out their home schedule. They rely a lot on driving revenue with the home games. And that's, that's the key driver with the two games against New Mexico state. It's a state requirement now where New Mexico state gets a home game. You and them gets a home game because they're two revenue drivers for both. For both I, programs so i okay i i i'm gonna cut you off there because i lied uh they went to clemson they played them yeah. in clemson south carolina but then and they clemson went to disney goes to boise next year yeah, yeah yeah i saw that they they then went to disney world over thanksgiving weekend and played clemson vatech vcu and butler and then they beat st mary's and then they lost to washington state at home i was actually at that san francisco game they beat them early in the season because i was at the UNM Boise State football game. Um, so you played what one, 
two, three tournament teams in non-con, UNM played St. Mary's and bottom half of the, I don't know, the Ken Palm. Well, that was the NCAA's argument is most of UNM's quad one wins were in conference. Where if you looked at like a Boise State, they were what, five and seven or something like that in quad one games. And they had a few of those outside the conference. So um, that's what the NCAA is looking for. And I think that's what they're valu valuing more so than, than the in-conference play. And uh, Well, I've got, I mean, you guys have all said it. I'm bringing up my buddy, Mike, who worked for Alfred. And he was like, I've been a part of those meetings that you can't get anybody to come here. That's a source. Um, but I think they've, you know, to take the Boise they need to go to Boise. They need to follow the Boise um, structure. I agree with you guys. Nick, I don't agree with you. I think they need to play NMSU twice a year because it's just, I got to keep some sort of tradition. I, I don't, I just want a little bit of it. That's, that's all I want because it's all flushed down the toilet. Um, to I, I got Eric, go I want to respond to that. So, <laughs> it becomes more complicated this coming year because it in the mountain West conference schedule, it's going to go from 18 games to 20. So that removes two non-conference games off the schedule for UNM. So they got to be more strategic about how they're scheduling the non-con. And if two of those games are scheduled for New Mexico state, that's just going to devalue their, their strength of schedule because New Mexico state, quite frankly, I mean, maybe five or six years ago that that would be a decent game to, to play twice a year, but it's not anymore. And it's just kind of limiting them on how many quality non-conference games they can schedule now. No, I, I agree with that. Um, I, <laughs> maybe you're going to have to go to the, the, the one game a year because of the conference, I forgot about the 20 games um, to the comment section. John Romero on YouTube. Good to see the team back. I appreciate that. We appreciate that. Greetings to Ed, NMSU, Aggie adopted fan. Aggies have the banners. I uh, figured you'd appreciate that, Ed. And then John Romero again. Aggies have a bad year, and you want to drop them. Come on, Nick. Uh, he was quoting Patino there, John. So don't don't hate the don't hate the player. Hate the game. Uh, I don't even know if that applies there. I'm getting old. Um, uh. uh Ed to the All Star Game. So back to back years for the College All Star Game, UNM had the MVP of the game, uh, Morris Udaisy, Uncle Mo, last year. In where the hell was the tournament last year? I'm having a brain fart. Um, because Jeff Grammer went and got that award. Wasn't it two Dallas? years ago? Was, was it two Dallas years ago? Or? Was New Orleans? Was it? It was Houston. It was Houston. Houston. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, yeah. Well, he was in Phoenix. Um, Jalen House won the MVP. I don't have the stats in front of me with my journalistic due diligence, but uh, you were there for the first half. I mean, it's good for UNM. I mean, it's a little bit more publicity. I don't think anybody has their calendar marked for a Friday afternoon to watch the Reese's College All Star Game, um, but it's still cool. Uh, he had sixteen points. I think he had, he had uh, ten at the half, and um, you know, I thought he played really well. He said in the paper he was reading the pick and roll coverage and uh you know if they they dropped he shot the three if they didn't he hit the big man and uh he, he's trying to uh, he's moved to phoenix now with his daughters working out there trying to get ready for whatever career he's going to have and, and uh whether it be in the nba which i don't i don't see that uh the g league or overseas he's he's uh working out uh diligently there in his uh and that's i guess that's where he's from is uh, he uh, came from there so um, you know what? My brother and I enjoyed it. You know, he, I thought he played well. And there were some Lobo fans, not just us, rooting for Jalen House, which was pretty cool, too. So uh, he played the first half. I only saw the first half. He played very well and was a game's MVP. So congratulations to him. Rick, I wanted your thoughts on that. Yeah, the, Mainly I because... think. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I just think he showed a little bit that he was throwing some lobs. He can be a, a distributor maybe on the next level. And I, I never really saw him as an NBA player, but after watching, you know, the last month of his game and how he took over some games, I, I think he could at least make a summer league roster here and have a chance, you know, to compete in summer league and, you know, go from there. Um, so I was, I was impressed with him and I, you know, he really did great interviews and said good things about the team. So 
hats off to him and just, you know, capping off a great, you know, last month or two months to his college career here. Well, back to the comment section, Jimmy Hester. Jalen House is the man. Um, Eric, you played guard. I just want in somebody that has a higher, I don't like to say it, a higher basketball IQ than I, because all I do is lose money on college basketball. So just <laughs> your thought. Yeah, well, I think the, the best quality to Jalen House's game is just his ability to change the pace of a game in the blink of an eye, right? And not only was like his defensive pressure, but him with the ball in his hands, being able to push the ball up the floor and, I mean, break break presses by himself. Uh, and then, yeah, I think Rick really hit the nail on the head with his game kind of evolving and just maturing at that second half of the season with him being able to be more of a distributor and, and work off that pick and roll. And I did see some of those lobs in that Reese's game and, um, man, there were some really spot on passes. The timing was perfect. Uh, and and it, it's a hard read for any guard to play. And especially with the pace that Jalen House plays um, to do it for 40 straight minutes. Uh, he's he's a special player. Um, he's got a special energy to him. Um, he's a unique talent. That's for sure. I think he's definitely going to get the looks. Um, and I, I think I, I can agree with Rick, too, that he might see an NBA summer roster. Um, see how he fares uh the only downside to that i think he might be a little undersized and having to guard someone in the nba that's going to be six four six five at the point guard position might might be a challenge there but he's definitely got the ability to to push the pace and, and control the control the rhythm on the offensive side so um definitely loved watching play watching him play as a lobo for the for the few years that he was here and um i'm sure we'll follow the rest of his career too but that's uh, that's what I think. Just to the comment section, Dan Copeland not giving it Aztecs enough credit for tournament wins. That's not what I said. Yep, they had a few easy draws, but beat the number one seed of Alabama and a really good Creighton team and a strong FAU team last year. Not all Yale games. I'm fully aware of that. I am fully aware that they beat the number one seed Alabama last year. Um, and, and John Rothstein brought it up how quickly or how amazing one play can change the tournament. Because, or, or not just the tournament, but a coach, a player, a team, a program. Um, FAU had a jump ball against Memphis in the first round. They had, I think it was John L. Davis who hit the game winning shot against Memphis and that propelled their run. Um, no, I backed San Diego State because it was good for the tournament, uh, excuse me, good for the conference. Um, I just think there was a level of arrogance there um, and maybe a level of arrogance from the conference because. The Big East owned them, and Rick, we didn't even mention it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I was dro name dropping our friend Tim, uh, Seton Hall alum. They won the NIT. Uh, I thought they belonged in the tournament, probably over Colorado State, definitely over you. Anybody deserved uh, to be in over UVA, and that's not a diss on Tony Bennett. I just thought this year, um, I think Ryan Dunn's a NBA prospect. He's pretty good. I didn't watch them enough this year. Um, no, I give I give San Diego State credit. I think there's an argument from both sides where it's they they've positioned themselves again. Play the but the play the the uh, the um, play the hand you're dealt. Um, next topic that I wanted to get to um, is the top twenty five early preseason rankings. Uh, which I was quite shocked. Uh, ESPN, and it is Jeff Borzello. Duke number one, obviously, they are getting Cooper Flag, the number one recruit. Um, can, UConn's losing a lot of people. I don't know what Iowa State's doing, but TJ Olsenberger has done a phenomenal job there. Um, see what they're doing, but where it hits home is... UNM would be in the top 30, San Diego State there. Um, I think a couple of them had Boise. Rutgers, um, very excited for that. Jeremiah Williams is coming back. But um, that's ESPN. Kevin Sweeney, who we've had on the show, uh, I think has Duke number one, but has UNM at number 21. And Gary Parrish of CBS didn't have them, but also the field of 68, uh, Jeff Goodman there. Um, 
John Fanta, who uh, the Seton Hall guys that I know gives me a hard time. Uh, I like him for the reasons probably that you don't think. Uh, Field of 68, I think, had them in um, the top 30. Um, and then I saw a CBK basketball report that had top 40 basketball programs, and UNM was like 33. Um, I came on this podcast in last year and said, hey, it looks good on paper, but I'm from Missouri, so you got to show me. Um, and they kind of did this year. Um, I told this to Danny Gonzalez. I know it's a different sport. Uh, your job is to not that you care what I think, but your job is to shut me up. Um, I'd say that's good publicity. And Ed, I'm going to start with you on that because, uh, we were probably sitting on the edge of Lobo apocalypse, Lobo, Lobo apocalypse, where I heard grumblings allegedly um that patino would be leaving um that is not the case um obviously calipari to arkansas more dominoes are falling uh but i think patino is staying and looks like donovan dent and jt toppin are returning um but when you hear that and they're still in the conversation for how things have ended um you know i i it was it was so cool you know I, i'm always negative nancy but it was so cool to finally watch them all <laughs> on the Thursday or Friday in March in the tournament um, and things went South fast and they went South very fast. But when you see for you, with, as I always joke with the Lobo fans since 1970, when you see these expectations 48 hours removed from the national title game, what are your thoughts? Well, I think uh, we mentioned the, uh, the core that's coming back, Washington, uh, you know, you build around Dent and Toppin. But you've got Washington, Omzil, and Nelly, you know, all coming back right now. You know, Rick and I and, and uh, Eric have talked about the three, uh, a 6'6", six, six, 3 and D guy. Maybe it's Quentin Webb. He's still here. He hasn't left. So maybe maybe it is him. You know, we, we And we talked to him and we loved him. And we yeah. loved him. So may, maybe it is maybe it is him. Um, but I got to say this. There's always a transfer that we didn't expect to leave that leaves at the last minute. There's still unexpected news that might still come out of Lobo land. But what's coming back? I'm really excited. They may, they maybe add another shooter. Or, you know, the freshman Dotson and Middlesex, or however you say his name, they're coming in too. So I think with what they have uh, coming back, I'm very excited. Now Washington and Dent starting both of them together. Um, neither one of them shoot the ball well. It's a little concern there. But Omzil, they're slashers. You know, they're quick. They're going to uh, play with pace. And Dent, and one and uh, another year, it's going to be even better. Omzil going to the three. Uh, that's going to be big for New Mexico. He can also go inside if they need him, but hopefully they get some length off of the bench to uh, to come in and spell him and uh, you know get get some size there. So I, I think uh, I think it's uh, very exciting news as far as New Mexico's prospects for next year. And we mentioned the scheduling that's got to improve. It's Richard Patino you know, flirted with Louisville for a little bit. I didn't, I never really took that seriously. I didn't though. I, I really didn't. But that's okay. Things happen. He's staying. So right now. As far as what they have coming back next year on paper, and you said that paper cuts, you never know what can happen with with uh, with paper. But I'm pretty excited about the core that's returning here uh, coming back next year. I just want to share some breaking right. news that I just found on Twitter. BJ Reigns has released that uh, point guard Alvaro Cardenas from Boise uh, from San Jose State, really good point guard, has just committed to Boise State. So uh, an in conference transfer. Uh, Boise State just picked up a good one. Uh, definitely one of, like a more true point guard, but he does have some scoring ability and has experience within the conference. So um, that was the big announcement that that Boise State was anticipating that was going to be coming. I think Rick touched on it earlier in the podcast, but it's uh, it's out now. Uh, my, I think my the, go ahead, Rick. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rick. No, I was just going to say, we're going to get into the transfer portal, um, but somebody else within conference, the point guard from San Jose State, who I thought was a really good player, they're going to lose, probably lose two of those guys, is... Um, Has a Myron, it's Amy, uh, right? Myron, Myron Amy, and just, And also that their big guy from Turkey, his last name starts, Goriner. I think he's in the transfer portal as well. But when you look at this move for Boise, I mean, Roddy Anderson was playing kind of off guard this year and max rice isn't really a true point guard so when you bring cardenas is to me this is a huge move a true point guard that can distribute the ball and to me boise has the strongest 
arguable roster coming back with New Mexico at this point, based on what we know with the portal still being open a couple of weeks, with them bringing back Stanley, Degenhart, Ogbo, and now these two guards um, of Cardenas and um, who was the other one I just mentioned, the other guard. Um, but anyway, so I, th I think they have one of the strongest fives coming back with the Lobos, especially now with, with Cardenas. I think you got to look at them as a, a definite um, tournament contender, and this is just the start of transfer. I'm sure they'll they'll load up even more. But with, with their bringing back, um, you got to look at them as being at the top of the conference in my eyes. Well, I think that's a good point, Rick, because I think Boise State, for the most part last year, did pretty well with not having that true point guard player on their roster. I think it was more of a makeshift. Roddy Anderson was more of a scoring guard when he was out. Uh, Ryan, remember, uh, remind me which school he was, he transferred from. It was in the big West. Say the name again. I'm sorry. I was looking Ro at Roddy <laughs> Anderson. No, Roddy Anderson transferred to Boise state from, it was a big West school. He was like freshman freshman of the year i i forget but he's more of a, a a scoring important guard right score first and he was uc davis uc davis okay so yeah he was working all year to kind of transition into that point guard position to kind of get the, the team he wasn't looked to to score a whole lot even though he fared well in the in the in the tournament when he i'm did sorry get damn it some UCS, looks. uc san diego sorry ah uh, okay well, regardless, I mean this this gives Boise State that true point guard look, uh, and they also got some guys that that can fill it up too. So, um, yeah, they're definitely one of the stronger returning teams in the Mountain West for sure. All right. Well, I mispronounced uh, Mondragon on this podcast. Um, I said Mondragon because um, I know somebody that is a Mondragon. Um, Mr. Ed Nunez, Milosevic, Jovan Milosevic. Milosevic, thank you. Yep, because we're probably gonna have to learn. I <laughs> gonna have to say that right. I just um, before Rick, we move ahead. on, I guess from like the Lobos, looking at the Lobos roster as of right now, with still a few weeks before the portal closing. I mean, I think the Lobos still have four open scholarships, if I'm doing my math correctly, and they still have no shooting on this team. Um, Washington is not a shooter. Um, and I, I don't really foresee uh, the move to the three for Amzil. In my eyes, I still think he needs to play the four. I don't see him fast enough to play the three. So the transfer portal better bring some shooting or there's going to be some glaring um, problems on the offense. In my eyes, if there's no one to stretch the floor with Mash, House, and Baker being the only guys that really hit threes all year are now gone. There's one guy that can save us. His name's Robbie Avila from <laughs> Indiana State. I'd be all for it. Uh, Kurt, Abdul if, Jabbar. Kurt, if Kurt Roth, who is a friend of the show, if you're not bitching and moaning at JetBlue and Drew Herrig, uh, hey, Robbie Avila, I'm sure he's going to end up. How would you uh, like had, to be in Indiana State? They lost all five starters after such a great season. And like I said a few weeks ago, that's what's going to happen to these mid-major teams. It's kind of like a relegation system now, like soccer. If you play good as a mid-major player or coach, you're going to get bumped up. If you play bad in one of the big conferences, you could get bumped down. It's really interesting time uh, to watch. But it's really sad because... Avila and that school are going to lose all the fandom that they just built up over the last season as he probably follows their coach to wherever he went now. St. Louis, John, Josh Schertz, which is really, really kind of sad um, because there is history at Indiana State. And I mean, it's just not, I don't know. Nick, I'm sorry I haven't heard from you in a while. No, your that's thoughts, all right. Your, <laughs> no, that's all right. Any, your thoughts on anything in general? No, I'll just chip in on the Lobos a little bit. I mean, I agree they need to add some shooting to the roster, but just kind of recapping what their offense looked like throughout the season. I mean, this was a team that liked to play in transition. They were really good in the pick and roll. And then towards the end of the conference season, Coach Patino really tried to make it a point of emphasis to get the ball inside to the bigs, to JT Toppin and to Nelly Jr. Joseph. But they just seemed a little out of sync. And then you saw them in their NCAA tournament game. They struggled mightily in the half court with offense. So what's this team going to look like offensively next year? And I think that's a challenge going into the offseason. 
Clemson really did play that pick and roll really well. They stopped the ball penetration. They made it really difficult for us to get the ball inside. So um, a lot of good pieces to build around with Dent and Toppin coming in. We got to add some pieces in the transfer portal. Um, and we got to figure out offensively, what are we going to look like? Are we going to be a transition team? Are we going to be able to execute in half court? Because the game will slow down at some points. So, um, you know, questions going in, but like what we have coming back. To the comments, Jimmy Hester. Katie Dotson is a great shooter. That is uh, the point guard, the 6'2 kid from Beaumont, Texas. Uh, and Milosevic is too. Uh, I was just thinking that, Rick, maybe as you said that, I'm not sure. Um No, and I, I agree. They both are yeah. based on the film I've watched on them, but it's just a lot to ask a freshman to come in and be your knockdown shooters when there's really no other ones on the team outside of Amzil. But I, I agree. Those guys can both shoot it, and I'm looking forward to seeing them play. I think both of the freshmen coming in will be able to contribute um, in my eyes based on what, what we've seen. And how much does, does Apple Hands actually evolve and, and develop some strength. I mean, he's definitely got the shooting ability, but I think he struggled last year with just adjusting to the pace and adjusting to the physicality of the game because, man, he, he's, a, he's a bigger guy. He's probably going to be expected to guard and defend bigger bigger guys on the opposing team. And um, last year he just looked a step slow, but he was dealing with some, with some personal things, so that definitely attributed to that or kind of held him back. So hopefully he can get through that. But I could also see him being a key component a guy that can come off the bench spot maybe 10 minutes a game. But if he has the opportunity to, to catch and shoot and, and kind of at least extend the defense a little bit and let uh, Donovan Den and Toppin kind of work that pick and roll game, I think it's it's a good option that uh, or just a good piece that the Lobos can definitely play. Milosevic is uh, 6'10", power forward, 205 pounds. So I, I, I would think maybe that could – if any of the basketball guys, that could be uh... – you know your swing guy i don't know i haven't watched him play if he can yeah he he can he can pop out on the pick and roll he's comfortable shooting the three and pump faking and putting it on the floor uh, a little known fact apple hand shot 400 from three last year 40 so, uh, from three last year uh i mean was it really limited attempts though was limited yeah attempts. was it yeah i think he has the potential right but yeah, yeah no definitely it's about the look he even had a nice out. dunk you know a poster dunk i think he measures out at six foot seven so maybe he just need, needs an opportunity and i agree with ed webb um, needs a shot as well i think he he has potential i wanted to hit on some other stuff around the conference Basketball wise, before we get into whatever is going on with Bronco Mendenhall and UNM football, um, Deedon Thomas is staying at UNLV. Rick, you and I were high on <laughs> uh, were high on uh, UNLV this year. I thought they were a lot of fun to watch. If Neff was here, um, Rob Whaley Jr., the Boone brothers. I don't know if the Boone brothers have eligibility. I think I heard they're they both did. gone. I think the only know, returning yeah. starter is Whaley. Um, but they're bringing in some other transfers and freshmen. Yeah, I bought Kevin Kruger, Kruger some time because I had heard that you know he was on the hot seat. Um, and they won some games in the NIT, and they lost to Seton Hall and Jert and in Orange, South Orange. Um, I don't know. Just your thoughts on that. No, I, th I think a lot of speculation was made that Thomas might be going elsewhere, but uh, credit to him for hanging around and, and staying. It's good for the conference. And definitely good for UNLV. Um, I think he has a chance to be conference player of the year next year. Uh, other big news, and I'll let other guys hit on this because Danny Sprinkle, I I've said it a few times on this podcast. When I met him in Vegas at the conference media days and we talked to him and we interviewed him on this very show, I was like, man, this guy is <laughs> expletive. Uh, I don't know how no returning starters. I knew nothing. I knew he was at Montana State. I knew he got to the tournament. I knew nothing. Uh, what he accomplished bought you a ticket for three million, and in the Big Ten, now the Big Ten, uh, he's off to Washington. Uh, he loses Great Osabor, which is a great name. Um, Martin Ian Martinez in the portal, and Foslev is going to stay at Utah State. Um, Rick, I'll start with you though. Again, you brought that up. I don't know how these guys. I don't know what the hell Utah 
<laughs> Utah State does. Um, yeah, Jared credit to Calhoun. them. They, at least, at least they're keeping false love, uh, right? But losing those those other pieces, I wouldn't expect them to have a replay of what they just did. I think most people, including including Moser at the highest, had them preseason ranked at seven or eight, and it's going to be hard. For them, I see they're already gaining some transfers, but it'll probably take them um, unless they have another miracle season a, a while. But at least they're keeping Falsalev. He was on our all snake team, and I, I love watching him play. So glad he's staying in the conference. They're also uh, keeping that seven footer Johnson who can shoot it from the outside. I thought he played pretty well in the tournament, too. The, what, the one that I think. Um, well, yeah, he played well against or something. Yeah, he he committed to returning too. He uh, he's single. I mean, he was on fire against TCU. Um, credit to them for beating. T you know, at least they got the win. Um, Jared Calhoun is from Youngtown State. The Horizon League was phenomenal to watch this year between Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, Youngstown State scored a lot. Green Bay, Wisconsin was, I think, won the regular season title. They were they kind of slowed teams down. Um, Indiana, Purdue, Fort Wayne was fun to watch, um, but obviously Oakland, Colkey there, and you know, then I, you know, he 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 probably might end up getting a shot in the NBA. Look at Duncan Robinson. I saw that today, and I thought about that, and I was like, that's pretty accurate. Um, Rita's Petritus is taking an official visit to Texas. Um, Eric, you, uh, Eric, you let me know that I'm high on him. We loved him. Uh, he's responsible for, um, you know, that win against you and M here in the pit. And <laughs> I wanted to mention this, um, you and M had, uh, tweeted, you <laughs> and M had tweeted, come and celebrate with us on a phenomenal season. <laughs> um, here it is, uh, Lobo basketball, by the way, I did mention this, um, Lobo basketball tomorrow having um, a parade at Civic Center. The metal mayor will be there. By the way, Tim Keller's name is metal nickname is Metal Mayor because uh, he listens to metal. Um, I, I'm I'm doing it. I know everybody's going to hate it. Uh, they're celebrating at 4:30 at Civic Plaza. But UNM basketball tweeted this out: 2023-24 was a historic season. Thank you, Lobo fans, for your support, and we can't wait to share ever more success with you in the future. Mountain West tournament champions, first NCAA tournament appearance in, since 2014, 2,916 points scored. That's a school record. 226 wins, fit six most in program history, eight wins versus NCAA tournament teams. Um, that's jaded because that's the conference. Three wins in the pit versus AP ranked teams led the Mountain West in scoring, rebounding, block steals, turnover margin, and scoring margin. Uh, first team to ever win the Mountain West tournament with four wins. Uh, so quite accomplishment. And then you lost to Air Force at home, who was bottom half 200 <laughs> in Ken Palm and uh, what the net ranking. So, um, Ed, when you hear that, though, I'm going to you on that. When you hear that, your thoughts with all of that stuff and just ignore my comment at the end. Um, yeah, it's just a lot to uh, to unpack there. You know, it really is. Um uh yeah i uh I, um I, it's uh i really don't know what to say to that to be honest with you that's a lot of lot of lot of lot of a uh, lot of lot of things to unpack there and uh i'll let uh your comments uh speak for that i, I yeah <laughs> that's a lot i mean it's unpack. i mean it's a it's a lot of positivity it's it's a lot of great things um i am I am guy that your losses outweigh your wins and Rick, I will bring it up. Uh, I will use Kobe as an example because I know he was phenomenal and he was fantastic, but there's always to me the 2004 and 2008 NBA finals. Um, I'm a New York football giants fan. So you know where I'm going with that. Um, look at Purdue. They had a phenomenal season, but they did not win it all. Um, and that air force win, that air force loss lingered with them. And had they not beaten San Diego state, it would have been the season. Um, Eric, to you, when you hear all those amazing stats, <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, I don't know. It's it's a little bit of a of a fluff in my my opinion, but um, I can't take anything I'm... really away from them. They were back in the tournament. They hadn't been in the tournament in the last ten years, so that's where they need to be. And 
essentially they just got a bad matchup and I think a seating adjustment could have kept them out of that. And if they wouldn't have lost to air force, that could have been different, but um, I'll take them being in back in the tournament over anything else. So I'll leave my comments at that. I, I guess I'm talking to the same Eric Malt. Nick, I just wanted, I read that your thoughts. Yeah, maybe I'm the eternal optimist. I don't know. I mean, I think it was a pretty solid year. Uh, first conference championship in 10 years. You know, Lobo fans seem to have these really high expectations for a program that's never made the Sweet 16. Um, hopefully we just keep going up in the right direction. It's because I was thinking, of, I know I'm making the football comparison. It's like the Rocky Long days. Like we're going to the BCS. All right. Well, you know, uh, cool. Um, join us. This is from Lobo Basketball. Join us Thursday for a celebration of the Mountain West Championship. City of Albuquerque and Mayor Keller will be honoring UNM basketball at 4.30 p.m. at Civic Plaza. The free event will feature food trucks and basketball hoops in Civic Plaza from 3.30 to 5.30. Um, I don't know if Jalen House is going to be there because he's um, uh, in Phoenix. And Jimmy Hester, I don't care what any of you say. I'm damn proud of what this team accomplished. That's fair. And this show is for the people, too, so I agree with you there. Um, Javante Johnson is transferring again from CSU. Didn't mention that. Um, I think that's probably uh, a big deal. I, he didn't see much action. Uh, Rick, you were somebody, I think maybe it was Rick or Ed. You, I can throw this to both of you. Um, I don't know if it was a good decision for him to transfer to CSU to begin with. Uh, yeah, he, he didn't get to even play in a blowout. And I thought that was, uh, that was telling they, you know at the end of the year he didn't he didn't play very much at all against New Mexico twice um you know actually he played okay for UNM when he was here but they they up you know they they got Amzil here and Amzil was a better player whoever they got uh, better players than than him and just to answer uh Mr. Hester we're all proud of what the Lobos accomplished I don't think there's one person on here that's not proud of what they accomplished you know you, you mentioned that Eric they hadn't been in the tournament since uh, 10 years man 2014 so they they're in they they uh, won the Mountain West tournament and there's things to build on. I don't think there's one person on here that's not happy with what they did. So you know, huh, uh, back at you, man. That's that's I think everybody <laughs> here is pretty pretty happy about. It. I know I am. So uh, anyway, um, yeah, that's that's what I think about Johnson. I think you know what he thought there was greener pastures in Fort Collins. You know, no pun intended. It is green there. Their uh, you know their team is is uh, green colored uniforms, but it didn't work out. And uh, maybe he thought things were going to be better. But like I said, when he didn't play in that blowout, that was telling to me, even when he didn't play very much against New Mexico. So good luck. You know, he's got another chance to go play somewhere else. And that's good. the good thing about the portal. I, I will say this about John Javante. I, I, th I think that if he would have stayed, he probably would have seen some minutes. Just just based on his defense ability, his, his, his strength, his rebounding ability. Um, it was something that the Lobos had had missed this year. Someone like that that was willing to get kind of dirty on the defensive side. Um, he was a decent shooter. He knocked in a couple threes the year before that. I think they would have found more minutes here if he wouldn't have, if he wouldn't have left. But um, yeah, definitely not any greener pastures around where wherever he ended up. If I'm not mistaken, he was a Paul Weir recruit. So I'm like, man, how many more years does he have left? Uh, but I know he was from Color Colorado Springs, recruited out of Colorado. Maybe he thought going to Fort Collins would have been better for him. Uh, tough roster for him to find some minutes. So an interesting transfer decision. But one more year and best of luck for best of luck to him. Going back to Jimmy Hester. Uh, thanks for being good sports. Next season is going to be even more special. I'm saying this again. The opinion of this. My opinion on this show is not uh, reflect these other guys or the site. Um, I think we tried to shoot it as you, uh, you know, I mean, maybe I'm a little bit more outspoken because I have a history with the program. But anyway, um, that's not here nor there. We enjoy talking. We're going live now. We enjoy the interaction. This show is for a community here within Albuquerque for UNM. We're all UNM alumni. Um, and we, as Eric and I have always said, we started this because we felt the coverage, not a knock on Jeff Grammer and the Albuquerque Journal, um, just that there's not as much dedicated time to UNM. Um, and I feel that when they lose, nobody covers them and they get to the tournament and everybody's flocking to the site, uh, AKA Memphis this year. Um, but we appreciate you listening. Uh, I, everybody, um, uh, really appreciate it. Uh, I'm still, 
my still last ditch effort in the media. Um, some other topics. Um, yeah, we mentioned Jericho, who and Javante Johnson. Um, Rick, I'm going to defer to this to you because we're going to switch gears um, with um, turning the Lobo football. The spring game is on April 20th. Um, I believe at 1.30 at UNM Stadium. Frank Mercogliano, if you're listening, I'm sorry I got that time wrong. Um, we all make mistakes. Um, let me make sure we, we've got it. Anyway, I'm going to defer to you. Um, but, uh, just you were on top of this. I hadn't been able to watch, been able to watch it. And Sean Ryder of the journal, um, was able to report it. Um, but seven Lobos had transferred and then we're leading up to the spring game. Um, and I'm going to defer to this comment first on football, perhaps NMSU should drop Lobos per dropping their strength of schedule rating. Sorry, Bronco, the devil. Jerry Kill made me do it. Patino and Nick, ouch. Um, you and uh, uh, NMSU. Man. NMSU. we got a lot of NMSU viewers tonight, I, which you I know, appreciate. You know, look, it, the tables have turned, and I'm Janet Jackson. In, in I'm going to quote Janet Jackson. I'm not Janet Jackson. I'm going to quote Janet Jackson. What have you done for me lately? Yeah, uh, NMSU was a, a shit stain on college football for years. And I'm not saying UNM was much better, but... I, uh, yeah. Thank you guys for covering the Lobos. I tune in all the basketball season. Can't wait for the next season. Uh, thank you very much there. Rick, you had kind of, Sean Ryder reported it. You might be in more in depth on this, but seven players had transferred for transferred out for UNM football. Um, what, you know, please, please educate us. Sure. I, I think it was kind of expected based on what We've heard from Coach Mendenhall. He was expecting, you know, once a few weeks of practice, get under his belt for some more players to make um, this decision to leave. And um, I think the the position groups that are looking strongest right now are some of the skill positions, obviously at quarterback with Dampier, uh, the clear cut starter, and then the running back. It looks like there's two or three guys that are going to be able to contribute. But um, for me, being a former offensive linemen and knowing how important it is and where the Lobos always seem to be weak is on the offensive and defensive line. And um, I, I believe a majority of the, or a few of the guys that left were um, linemen and they are lacking some size um, on the line and without offensive line being strong, it's hard for anything to happen. Right. Um, so I think this team's just going to take some time to find its identity with all these moving parts Um and people still deciding if they're coming or going, right? And I think we just got to be patient and, and let Mendenhall um, install the system and find the players that are actually going to stick around. So I think it's going to take, obviously, a few years. But um, I, I like the way he is. But his demeanor sometimes in his interviews don't seem like he has the utmost confidence sometimes in uh, what he's seeing out there. So it'll be interesting uh, to watch it unfold. Um, because I don't think we know who the starters are going to be in a lot of the positions yet. It is April 20th, Saturday, April 20th at 1 p.m. Um, I've said it multiple times, and if, Ed, Ed, you want to react to this, uh, as always, um, just with a little bit more, uh, you know, you've been around a little bit longer. I, You know, the Iraqi years were great, um, and I remember – as a kid going to Francione games um, in that special 97 season. But um, if Bronco, I was talking to this with somebody else and I'm not going to mention his name, um, but they were like Bronco Mendenhall in his, I've never met him. I don't know. Um, I'm trying to be more inept in this program now moving forward. Um, he just doesn't see me. He's like, well, I don't know. That's what I've gotten. And that's what I've been told in the interviews. It's like, well, we'll see. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I, my main point, and I've said it, and I've said it off the record, on the record. If Bronco Mendenhall can't win here, ain't nobody going to win here. Ed, I just want to. Well, you know what? Uh, real quick. I, I don't, you know, uh, real quick. Uh, he, he's a winner. He's a winner, man. He's won he Virginia. Is. He won at BYU. He's a winner. And and I think Rick makes a point. He knows football. He's been around the game a lot longer than me. Uh, moving parts, new system, uh, new defensive system, new offensive system. Um, Dampier, I'm glad he stayed as a quarterback. Uh, you know, I, I, I was reading about the linebackers today. There's some question about some of the linebackers and some of the experience that they have. So uh, he's a winner. That's the bottom line. He's a winner. He's won. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll quote Herman Boom from 
I expect to win. I will win. You know, I, I'm sure that's what he's thinking. You know, he's he, he's won before. Right now, it's an uncertain thing in the roster and and the players that he has on the roster. But I think you said the same thing, Ryan. I've, I've said this to my son too. If he can't win here, you know, who 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 can win? And you know, and so I was happy with the hire. So let's see how it all unfolds and unpacks. It's a whole new thing. It's a whole new world, and I'm I'm anxious to see how they're going to be. It may take a while. But Rick, you mentioned uh, the offensive line last year was one of their strengths, but a lot of those guys left. You know, so he said he's happy with the defensive lineman he had. I read about that in the paper. So um, it's going to take a while. It's not going to happen overnight. This is a program that needed some revamping and retooling, and they're just starting the process. Let's let's see what happens. I'm anxious to see what uh, how they're going to be. I, I'm only going to say one thing very quickly. It's, and I'm speaking on behalf of people I know. The only game that matters is September 28th down in Cruces. He's got to win that. I think he can win that in his first year with with what's going on down in state. Um, we've been talking for an hour and 15 minutes. Kind of, kind of wrap it up now. Um, I, I don't know. I wanted to do snake of the year, or if anybody has, as Gary Springer used to do. Any final thoughts? Jimmy Hester, one last time. Yes, let me be clear. I love these podcasts. We appreciate that. We post them on our Lobo website, especially the lives ones. We appreciate that. I love that. Um, yeah. yeah, we had a lot of people chime in, um, and I was blown away by the viewership that we've had. Again, I appreciate it. Eric, do you have anything to say? Uh, final thoughts? Because I, I know, know you got to go. Um, yeah, just want to touch again on that college huddle partnership that we're going to be looking into getting more involved with. They've got podcasts that podcast partnerships that span across the entire country uh they all talk college football college basketball so uh we'll keep coming live with with this and um updating our our fan base or our our, our viewers with content uh, on a regular basis and we'll look to kind of dive in deeper on the the unm football program we've got something cooking there so um thanks for the viewership thanks for the followers continue to to share these we appreciate it um, if you don't already give us a give us a follow, subscribe to our channel because it helps us in the long run. And uh, we look to continue building this thing out. Um, does anybody want to do a snake of the year as we as we sign off for the 2023, 2024 basketball season? And uh, man, I'm looking for it. What did I do with the soundbite? Anyway, I lost it. Um, I will I will start. <laughs> And I'm probably going to irritate a lot of people with this, and I found it. My my stake of the year um, was the best tweet I ever read, uh, and it's my friend T-Mac at T-Mac ABQ. Quote, sorry I'm drunk and happy, but this erases the bad memories of my <laughs> ex-wife going undefeated in Vegas during our four years together during the Alfred era. Go fuck yourself, Tiffany. Enjoy Riverton, Wyoming, where you fucking belong. Hashtag talking shit. That was my favorite tweet of the year. Uh, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care if I get in trouble for that, um, but that cracked me up. Um, so in regards to Lobo basketball, mm, chef's kiss. Uh, I think I know who you voted for. Um, <laughs> Nick, I'll start with you. Do you have uh, anything that you enjoyed from this season? That's not a tweet like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough one to follow up, Ryan. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, no. That's all right. Uh, no, I mean, there's a lot of great things from this season. Um, if I had to pick a snake of the year, I guess it'd go to Jalen House. Um, kind of a love-hate relationship that he had with Lobo fans. But as Rick alluded to in that All-Star game, he said some really nice things about Albuquerque, about the UNM basketball program. Um, I think hopefully he continues to be a good ambassador for UNM basketball. So snake of the year, I'd give it to Jalen House. Rick, I'll go to you. Any final thoughts? Uh, snake of the year, anything it can, anything you want it to be? Um, I mean, if we're going outside of the, the Lobos, we got to give it to Coach Hurley. And Yukon, maybe not snake underwear, but wearing his same dragon underwear and making his wife wash his underwear on the road every game. My wife would not be doing that. So hats off to the Hurleys and bringing their portable washer to the championship. Uh, Ed, to you. I think, uh, you know, one thing I want to say real quick, congratulations to Michael Cooper, the former Lobo. Oh, yes. Elected to the uh, Naismith Hall of Fame. That's a huge honor and you know hopefully down the line we can get him on the Lobo Legend series so I definitely wanted to mention that but uh JT Toppin is my snake of the year I really enjoyed watching him play and I'm looking forward to him coming back a summer's worth of growth natural maturation and strength training 
he's only going to be much better next season. I can hardly wait. So that's my snake of the year. I'm just going to interject here very quickly. Juan, I hope I pronounce your name right. I'm sorry. Baeza. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Vonovitz, Ed Vonovitz. Um, <laughs> are you all going to be doing this type of for football as well? For, just very quickly, last year, we talked to Danny. We had him on about six times during the season. We spoke to him in Vegas. Uh, we had Ned James. Ed and I had Ned James on every Thursday, former quarterback for UNM, was a coach in the NFL, works for UNM now, and does work with J.J. Bucket Lobo Radio Network. Um, I, probably out of all five of us here, and Neff, Jacob Neff, who, again, is not with us now, recovering from surgery, uh, I'm an avid college football fan. Uh, so the answer to that, but yes, the answer is yes. We tried doing it last year. Um, I want to provide as much. I'm going to try to do what I can with the spring game. Um, again, we have something cooking in the works with a former player that we hope can <laughs> bring a lot with us. And maybe this is the week to have him on. Um, so the answer, Juan, is yes. Um, and re who did I forget for snake of the year? Uh, Eric, sorry. Yeah, my, you know, my pick. I know you loved mine. Yeah, <laughs> loved yours actually. <laughs> uh, uh, if I have to stay within the program, I'm going to have to go with Donovan Dent. Uh, just the overall involvement of his game development from freshman to sophomore year, he definitely put himself on the map nationally. Uh, we saw him grow and turn into a leader of this team. Um, but outside the program, um, all in college basketball, uh, I'm going to have to go with uh, the women's game. Um, not only Caitlin Clark, but just the growth of the women's college game and where it currently stands. I think they, they actually had more viewers on the national championship game than the men's game did. And now I'm me and my family are expecting a little girl into this world here in the next couple of weeks. So um, we're going to be watching a lot of women's basketball um, with, with Ed and Nick doing, doing the high school show. I think we'll get more involved with that too. Um, but yeah, just women's basketball, the growth of it and the impact that, those women had this year and um all in all so that that would be my snake of the pick or my snake of the the year just to dovetail off that real quick ryan and i know we retweeted it out but uh, bella hines signing with lsu huge huge signing and then everyone tuned into our interview with her that we had a couple months ago on road to the pit um but yeah just to dovetail off of what eric said uh no that kim um, kim mulkey um don't care what you say she's She's entertaining. She should probably, if she retires, she should join the WWE. Um, I want to thank everybody for listening. And on behalf of my business partner, Eric Moulton, please watch out for what we're doing. Uh, David Fresquez, congrats, Eric, girl dad. Hashtag girl dad. <laughs> um, um, yeah, congrats, congrats Eric. Um, I'll, I'll stick with one boy, one child and one child only, and it's a boy. And now he's turned... He's not Batman. He's fart man. So I'll just stick with that. Um, uh, behalf of Eric Moulton, Mr. Ed Nunez, the voice of the Western Mexico Mustangs, uh, Rick Thompson uh, out in the Bay Area, um, home of the Oakland Athletics who've played decent baseball, uh, and Nick Nunez of ProView Networks. Um, we appreciate everybody listening. We appreciate uh, everything. Uh, and hopefully this will get the ball rolling, rejuvenated, um, and more content starting this week. And yes, uh, do want to talk uh, more Lobo football. Uh, that's very important in my wheelhouse. So thank you for everybody that tuned in. Um, we'll talk to you soon. Enjoy the rest of your week.